And so this morning, as I said, we're going to be looking at uh, an introductory message on stewardship when it, as it relates to our money. And uh, I want to look just as a way to start in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. If you want to open it up to your Old Testament, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You may recognize Exodus 20 is uh, the Ten Commandments are given there. And it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, or his ox or his donkey, uh, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. All right, so that kind of covers it all, doesn't it? You, you don't covet this, 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 or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. And we're going to look this morning at the three C's of financial stability as it relates to this whole aspect of stewardship in our lives. And I want to open in prayer first, and then I was inspired by Ed German, who, who, what, who couldn't be inspired by Ed German, right, last week. Um, I've got a little, uh, some props that I'm going to show you to begin with. Don't worry, it's not a dog or a cat or a box or whatever, but I've got some props. It'll take just a moment. Father God, we want to thank you for this day, the opportunity, Lord, that we have had to uh, sing your scripture, uh, to praise your attributes. And now, Lord God, as we come together to pray, to make intercession as well. Uh, Father, now as we come together, we want to exalt your word and, Lord, see our lives changed so that we might act in obedience with what your word would say to us. We pray, God, that you'll direct us now in this time, for we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I have th three items. And I want you to tell me which one of these three items blah, is not a tool. I should have wiped this thing off. It is, <laughs> it is grotesque and filthy. Kids, which one's not a tool? Which one's not a tool? Yes, Martin. Okay, money, he says, is not a tool. Martin, you are a very bright boy, but that is not the right answer. All right? Yes, young man. Christopher. Well, I think it's a tool. I think it's a tool. I gave you a trick question, actually. And what is the trick question? They are all tools. And uh, let me ask you this. Which one of those can I hurt you with? All of them. Very good. Which one can I hurt myself with? All of them. All of them, right? Uh, and so if you really think about it, all of these are tools. Now, why is it most people don't have a fascination with hammers? I've got a special hammer that was my dad's hammer. It's probably 75 years old now, and I only use that on very special occasions, okay? Um, I don't, that, that hammer down there is a nasty one I got years ago, but it's not. I, but my hammer, my one hammer, I kind of reserve that for special things only to use. Um, but I don't have a collection of hammers. I don't lust over hammers. When I go to Menards, I don't sit there and just look at hammers, you know, all day long. I, you saw what that, that old uh, sawmill skill saw looks like. Um, I don't really lust over those, right? I, I don't have... 50 or 100,000 of those sitting around in my garage. Why do we look at money any differently? It's a tool. That's all it is. And we need to think about that in relation to our spiritual lives. Money is nothing more than a tool. So we spend our lives trying to get it. We lust for it. We covet for it. We sometimes steal. Uh, we sometimes kill uh, for it. Would you do that for a hammer? Would you do that for an old nasty saw? Would you do that? We have to think about these things. And during his three and a half year ministry, Jesus spoke more about heaven, more about hell, more about salvation, or more about money. Money than any of those other topics. Would you believe, as I said, money? And having a proper biblical concept, understanding of money is essential to our growth and our maturity as believers. And today we're going to look at three C's, okay? The letter C will be the easy way to understand it, of stewardship, of financial stewardship. Stewardship is simply this. It is the recognition that everything I have is ultimately from God, 
and I am simply entrusted to use it for his glory. Is that an easy way to understand stewardship? Stewardship. So what you have, your house, your car, um, maybe your apartment, maybe your computer, whatever it is that you have, God has given that to you, allowed you to have that, but it's under his proper usage in which we are to use that. Now, uh, religious giving since 1990 is down by 50% in America. Down by 50%. Now, uh, that's nationwide. All U.S. Christians last time, if you were to take all U.S. Christians in all denominations across the board, only 2.5% of those tied their income last year. Did you hear me? Nationwide. Of uh, families making 75000 per year or more, only 1% tied last year. It's, it's phenomenal, the numbers. So we're going to look today at these three C's of financial stewardship, and I apologize, but we are going to have to pop around a little bit in the scriptures to see this, but we're going to hopefully come to a better appreciation and understand of what your and my responsibilities are when it comes to money and the usage of it. Now, the first is this. To successfully master or take control of money, you have to realize the danger of coveting. That's why I read to you the scripture from Exodus chapter 20. Realize there is a danger in coveting. Mastering our money begins by realizing we shouldn't covet anything in our lives. We shouldn't, except I think the only thing that would be fair to covet is a, more, a, a, growing, a better growing relationship with the Lord. Coveting is a sin we Christians need to especially be aware of in our personal lives. Now, as I said, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, but also Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 21, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 25, all of these uh, state the commandment, thou shall not covet. And if you were to look through, and we will next month, look through all of the Ten Commandments, the tenth is the most interesting one, in my opinion, because it doesn't have to deal with actions. It deals with attitudes. Attitudes. We're told not to commit adultery. We're committed, you know, not to do, we're not to kill. We're, to, we're committed, uh, commanded not to do this. But this is the commandment that goes to kind of the heart of the matter. And it shows us that God is not concerned with actions alone, but God is also concerned with our attitudes. And coveting at its very root is a heart issue. It is a heart issue. It's an attitude issue. What is coveting uh, and, and why do we need to reject it in order to properly uh, master the money that the Lord gives us? Well, to covet is to desire something. To covet something means to desire it uh, and, and for a person to want to make it their own or to take it for themselves. And uh, it's oftentimes in the Old Testament Hebrew, it's oftentimes put together with another word uh, that, that essentially means um, to steal. So we want something, we long for that something, and then we go ahead and we steal that thing, and it tells you the condition of our heart. And that's why I don't want these just to seem like moralistic messages, okay? These aren't moralistic messages. Uh, this is for a Christian audience. The only way that you're going to know that this is wrong is if you've come to an encounter with Jesus Christ and you recognize a transformed life in Christ can lead to a different type of living than what a natural life is. So we need to realize that coveting is deadly. Uh, why is coveting so deadly? Because, you know, it is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. If you covet that woman or you covet that man, you're going to covet another one. If you covet... That object, you're going to covet another one. That one won't suffice for you. Our heart is at the center of the problem. And when we seek, when we covet, we seek our own affections here and now rather than seek after the things of God. It is self-seeking. And when we seek after our own desires, our own wants, we go down into the muck 
and the mire of envy and slander and pride and adultery and murder and thievery and lust for more and more and more. Our desire is to steal, to take, and you know what? Eventually it destroys us. Have you ever known somebody that had a hobby or passion for something that just overwhelmed their whole lives? Right? We've all known people like that. Started off real small, started off, but then it became more and more an issue and then just gobbled up their entire lives. God wants us to enjoy our lives. God certainly gives us plenty of blessings to be able to enjoy in life, uh, but they are all to be in their proper place. Pastor Bob James tells a story, and having lived in the South for a long time, I could relate to this. He, he told the story about laying a small circle of poison around a hill of fire ants. Okay? If you guys are all, if you've always lived in the north, you don't know what fire ants are, but I guarantee if you are ever in the south, you will be introduced to those little boogers, and you will hate them for the rest of your life. Okay? Fire ants are little tiny ants. They usually have these big mounds that you'll see, and you'll accidentally think that there's something else than they are. You'll kick those over or step on them, and then millions of them will be on you. And they bite, and they are called fire ants because when they bite you, your leg is on fire. Or your foot is on fire. Your arm is on fire. And so pa Pastor James took this, uh, this tiny granule of poison and he put them around the, the outside of the fire ant hill and thinking that they would come up and take them into the colony and then, of course, kill the colony. But he returned a few days later and, and he saw actually a string of, of sweet ants, you know, the ants that eat the sweet uh, food. And they were the, the little tiny black ants. And they were coming up and they were going to that poison, and they were taking it back to, them, to, to their own uh, dens or their own nests or whatever you call those things, hills. And uh, all the while, they thought what they were getting, they were stealing it from those stupid old fire ants, right? And what ultimately happened is they were unwittingly poisoning themselves. See, that's what coveting does in our lives. We think that we're going to get that from somebody. We think that we're going to Go ahead, we're going to take this, we're going to be fulfilled in this. It's going to meet whatever the thing the need, that we think is our need. And all the while, it's going to kill you. It's going to poison you. Because coveting is poisonous. We need to recognize that at its root, coveting is idolatry. And as such, covetousness is a sin that is punished by God. So when you and I make our bank account, when we make our checkbook, for, I guess young people don't carry checkbooks anymore, but when you make your online giving statement, I don't know what it is, the goal of life, you are coveting. You are, I am, making an idol out of something that never was ever supposed to be an idol. The best way to understand the Old Testament is to, to interpret the passage by the commentary that the New Testament makes on it. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6, we see that the Apostle Paul does just that. The Apostle Paul is warning the Corinthian congregation by looking back scores of centuries to interpret the failure of the Jews wandering in the wilderness. And he said that their failure was linked to their evil cravings or their desire for evil things which tripped them up spiritually. And so he's telling the Christians then in Corinth, let their failure be a lesson to you. My father had a lot of folksy, homespun kind of wisdom statements. And one of my favorite, they used to say, was learn from the road rash of someone else. Now, I'm sure some of you are scratching your head and saying, what in the world is that supposed to mean? Yeah, we, we had, we, that was our response too as kids. But what it meant was is we were a family of bicycle racers, and when somebody wrecked, you called that road rash, right? And, and so you learned how to go into a curve, or you learned when to stop, or that by the accident that somebody else had had. And so what he was trying to communicate, and what the Apostle Paul here is saying much more clearly is, don't covet. Don't covet. Learn from these things. Learn from the failures of other people. Don't covet. Certainly we can think back in the Old Testament, back in Joshua chapter 7. A very notable story stands out in our mind. After 40 years of wandering through the promise, towards the promised land and wandering in the wilderness, Israel has just now entered into the promised land. They're, 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 they're there now. 
they've just defeated big old Jericho. And now they're taking on little AI, right? And it's like you've just invaded and, you know, uh, kicked the stuffing out of, you know, a big country. And now you're going towards Liechtenstein, right? And, and so the, the, the Hebrew children, they, they go up and, and they go to attack AI and they get their backsides beat. And 36 of their soldiers are killed in the process, and they run back, and Joshua and others are weeping before the Lord in prayer. They're on their faces weeping. You know, why, God, did you lead us out? Why did you lead us out of slavery only to be destroyed by AI? I think it's funny, in that passage, God says, get up off your face. Well, a few times in Scripture where God tells somebody, quit praying. Quit praying, quit weeping, quit confessing. There is sin in the camp. Oh, boy. There's sin in the camp. And so the Lord does something amazing, and through a very dramatic process, if you've not read the story, you ought to read the story, because by lot, he calls out the tribes, and he calls out the families, and it comes right down to this last family of Achan. And Achan and his family are standing there before the entire assembly of the people of Israel. And Achan confesses. Yeah, when we went into Jericho, even though there were certain things under the ban, God said, don't steal these things, don't take these things. These things are dedicated to me. He says, even though that was the case, I coveted a beautiful mantle. And I coveted 200 shekels of silver and a gold bar that weighed 50 shekels. And he said, as a result of that, I coveted those things. I brought them back, and I, I hid them in my tent. And guess what? God judged that. And people died as a result of that. And not only those 36 soldiers, but if you remember the story, Achan and his family and his livestock were all stoned and burned up because of the sin of coveting and idolatry. Coveting is serious because at the end of the day, it is idolatry. It's idolatry. When we idolize our 401Ks or our IRAs or our whatever other A's that we have, at the end of the day, we are making those an idol in our lives and trying to replace our security being in God to our security being in numbers on a piece of paper or on a computer screen. Let me tell you what, though. In Jesus Christ, we can overcome coveting. The Apostle Paul gives us a very interesting insight into his own spiritual life. In Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, he talks about the fact that of all of the sins, he, seemed to ma he, was, he was okay with everything in his spiritual life except for what? Coveting. He says there in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, it, it, when he came to the law, this is the one of the Ten Commandments that jumped out at him and kind of pointed the finger at him and said, Paul, you are a coveter. And he said he was convicted of his own sin because no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't overcome his coveting. But now you fast forward several years in Paul's life, and there's an interesting story. It's just a side note. In Acts chapter 20, verse 33, the Apostle Paul is saying goodbye to the Ephesian elders, and while he is there talking to them, I find it very interesting. He says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. As long as I've been here preaching and teaching, I have not coveted anything that you've had. Let me tell you what that says. That says, in Jesus Christ, you can overcome this. That says, Jesus Christ can give us new affections. That says Jesus Christ can take what we covet, what we idolize, and he can change that in our minds and in our hearts. The first step to mastering your money is to reject coveting. Second of all, to successfully master our money, we must pursue the peace of contentment. Turn in your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Don't be worried if it takes you a little while to dig around in your Bible and find it. Try to find it. If you'll notice, I put these in the front of mine so there'd be little cheaters for me. So I wouldn't be up here looking around, where's Hebrews, where's Hebrews? <laughs> I know where it is, but 
You try to stand in front of a bunch of people sometime and lose it. So, To successfully master our money, second of all, we must pursue the peace of contentment. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Let your character be free from the love of money. Being content with what you have, for God has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever leave you or forsake you. I find it interesting. This is another one of those verses that when we tend to quote them to people, we quote them entirely out of context. Right? We're, we're talking about people who use this verse as an eternal security verse, and there is truth to that as an application that can be made. But it's really, you can trust God for your provision. That's what he's saying here. God says, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. I will meet your basic needs. And let's face it, he meets a lot more than those two, doesn't he? He meets our wants, too, a lot of times. Let me tell you this. Contentment should be a goal in our Christian lives. Can you and I honestly say that we're content with God's provision for our lives? What's contentment? Contentment is not simply about settling for what we have, but it's trusting in what God has said. Both anxiety and greed rise in our hearts as God's word falls from our hearts. When the author of Hebrews wanted to teach his readers about contentment, he told them an old story with a familiar refrain. He quieted their fears, quenched their greed by reminding them that God has said, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Be content. Doesn't mean that you can't seek to improve. Doesn't mean that you can't plan for the future. Doesn't mean, but it means don't be covetous. Don't be covetous. These are building on themselves, hopefully. That's what we're going to do here. Coveting, contentment, and we'll get to the next. Contentment. Do you know that in a 2018 market study, the American marketing industry is now a $1.2 trillion business and growing. Marketing is built on what? Marketing is built on the concept of discontentment. Discontentment. You cannot watch TV, YouTube, Facebook, any other form of media, news, gaming, whatever, without being bombarded by some slick ad whose goal is to make you discontent with what you have or work all the harder to purchase something that you really do not need. Welcome to America. That's what drives our economy. And it becomes unnecessary or obsolete junk that it will be, cause you to be more miserable five, ten years from now than you are today. But in that advertisement, they will tell you, you cannot possibly live or enjoy life without this. Amen. They lie. They lie. Randy Alcorn, who's kind of an expert in many different areas, but Randy Alcorn has written, and he said, and I guess he has evidence to prove this, that by the time the average American is 20, 20 years of age, you will have seen one million advertisements. Do you know how many that is a day, math people? That's a lot <laughs> from a non-math person. That's 137 a day, day in, day out, all of your life, telling you, be discontent with what you've got. You need something more. But the author of Hebrews comes back, be content with what you have. Aren't those terrifying words in our culture? Six words. Be content with what you have. Yeah, six words. I don't know as though there's any more terrifying words today in our culture. Be content with what you have. It certainly is like a, a cannon blast in the face of, of our culture today. Don't let your heart endlessly pine for what you might have one day, but cultivate a satisfaction in the person of God today. I don't think there's anything the matter with saving for retirement. I'm doing it. Okay? I don't think there's anything the matter for planning for trips. We've done it. Saving for a big purchase, there's nothing the matter with that. 
but I've also known a lot of people who have worked night and day and put money aside and, and gone without in order to, you know, have a retirement nest egg that the, the, uh, the, the uh, advisors will tell you the size of the nest egg that you have only to die a week or two before they retire. Wow, it gets to go to probate and be given to the state and then have your heirs fight about it afterwards. The word for content is the same word that the Apostle Paul used when he said of, uh, uh, when Jesus, I'm sorry, says to the Apostle Paul, my grace is sufficient, sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in your weakness. He says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Don't covet. You ever seen when there's looting and rioting after you know, a natural disaster or, or you know, something like that happens? People, well, they, they all loot and they all go to the appliance store. You know, I wonder, why does everybody go to the appliance store? You don't even have power, right? We are in South Carolina. There was some small looting after the hurricane came through. It's like... The funny thing that they realized was, or that they've researched, is everybody, what they steal, they already have that in their house. They didn't need that. You know, go steal something you do need. No, don't, don't, don't steal. But, <laughs> but you, you understand what I mean, and it's why, because that 38 or 54-inch screen sure looks nicer on the wall than my 48-inch screen, right? You got to sit in the other room to see it anyways. Don't covet. When we live content in Christ, we demonstrate our trust in God. Amen. Turn Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance, this is the Apostle Paul, I am. I know how to get along in humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It has absolutely nothing to do with running a race or shooting a basket or playing football, right? It has to do with being content. Look at what the apostle says here. He says here that basically there's nothing the matter if God has blessed you and you've worked hard for it. There's nothing the matter if you are experiencing the blessing of Sufficiency of wealth. Uh, there's no necessarily uh, bad thing, spiritually speaking, if that's not your condition. But he's also saying that in both of those conditions, we can sin, can't we? We can become wealthy and arrogant and proud and, and, and forget about God. We can become poor and forget about God and steal or do something like that as well. Uh, neither condition is a guarantee of spirituality. So he says, keep your life free from the love of money. That is so hard to do in our culture today, isn't it? The secret of contentment is to enjoy life whether you're in prosperity or in want. There's no sin in having a lot. There's no virtue in being broke. Amen? amen. Paul said, <laughs> I love that amen. Paul said that one can be content in either situation. Where does it begin? It begins in the attitude of our minds, the attitude of our heart, right? We can be content because why? The Lord is our provider. The Lord is our provider. So many times we get concerned about what's going to happen in the future, what's going to take place, and we get all anxious about that, and we get all worked up about that. And we, you know, maybe have a little breakdown about that or, or, or whatever it is. You just have to do the next thing. And you can do the next thing with God's grace or by God's grace. You do the next thing. You don't have to worry. Uh, you can be content. Um, in 1 Peter chapter uh, 1, verse 8, you know, we have a joy inexpressible. We have a joy inexpressible within us because of Jesus Christ, not because we've got tickets to the Hawkeye-Iowa State game right. or whatever else it may be that comes along. Now, that's great. 
I was glad, though, that I didn't go to that one. I was glad I got to watch that from home. I don't expect a game's going to last six and a half hours or whatever it lasted. Contentment with godliness, though, the scripture tells us there is great gain. Contentment with godliness, there is great gain. If you drift into trusting your wealth rather than the Lord for your present or your future security, you're going to make shipwreck of your life. If you're storing up treasures on earth and ignoring the ones in heaven that you should be storing up, you will lose it all, Scripture says. If you live in abundance but you don't help your neighbor, you are committing the sin of Sodom, is what the Scripture says. If you are seeking contentment in money or things rather than God himself, you will come to an empty life. Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Be very careful about what people will tell you to do in society with your money. It doesn't make sense to a non-Christian person to tithe. It doesn't make sense, does it? doesn't make sense, but that's part of what God wants from us, to be content. And part of how we become content is to honor him with the first fruits of what he gives us. Third, mastering our money is recognizing the joy of contributing. So we have to overcome being covetous, and you can only do that in Christ. And then we have to learn contentment which we can only have in a relationship with Christ. And then we can experience the next level of it all, and that is to be joyful in giving your money to somebody or something else. The world will look at that and say, are you insane? You're going to give your money or some of your money, a portion of your money to someone or something else? So, let me just outline this. Well, that we're going to find in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. So if you'd like to turn there, uh, you may. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Let each one of you do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So we've moved from the sinful behavior of coveting, to the kind of stability of contentment, to now I want to introduce you to the joy of contributing. Uh, Friend, there is joy when you and I finally come around to realize that you can be a conduit of God's blessing in the lives of other people. That it's not just about you and storing it up for yourself and keeping it for yourself and you know, stroking and caressing your change and your money and all the rest. It's, wow, God puts something or someone on my heart and I respond to that and I help in a certain way financially and it speaks to those people or that person's heart, amen? amen. Because I guarantee you they have been praying for help. And then when you say something like, well, God laid it on my heart to do this, what's that communicate about the person of God? that he is alive, that he is intricately and intimately involved in their lives and our lives, right? But let me tell you what. Some of us will never know the joy of uh, contributing because we grasp so tightly to what we think is ours. I had an old district superintendent. He said, if you're holding on to something like that, you're holding on to it and clinging on to it, guess what? You will never be able to receive God's blessing because you got to open your hand up to do that. And when we're clinging on to what we have, and we may think that what we have is smaller, we may think, well, what we have is great and large. But when we cling on to that so tightly, you will never be able to receive what God wants to give you as well. So the Bible tells us here, check your attitude in giving, in contributing. There's a joy that is associated with contributing. Now, I want to just tell you, when I became a Christian back in December 1983, I was in uh, in June of 1984, I got out of high school, I was working in an automotive factory in Indiana. I made $200 a week. And I remember going to church, that was the first time in my life that I remember tithing. I went and I was just so pleased with myself that I put a 20 in the plate. 
And I had joy. And let me tell you something. I come from a family, we're naturally tight ones, okay? We are naturally tight ones. And I just, and I don't think it was pride. I really don't think it was pride in, in doing that. And I don't tell you that story in pride at all. Um, but I just remember the joy of being able to contribute. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. God, I mean, people knew God had changed my heart because I put money in the plate, right? So we have to examine our attitude, and our attitude should reflect the joy of our salvation. I, I think I'm safe to say this, that God is more concerned with your attitude about giving than he is even about the amount that you give. Now, we've been given certain basics in Scripture, what we're supposed to give, but I really think it's our attitude that's even more important in a lot of ways. I've told this story before years ago. It's a true story. Ruth Graham told it when my father-in-law and uh, used to work for Billy Graham uh, told the story about her husband, Billy. And Billy and Ruth were visiting in a church. This was back in the 1960s. And it was the time for the offering to take place. And, you know, if you're Billy Graham, everybody in the congregation is going to look to see if you give, right, if you're visiting. And so... Uh, the, the offering, you know, the ushers have come forward, prayed. Dr. Graham starts reaching into his pocket. And he's reaching around in there, and the plates are starting to be passed, and he pulls it out, and he looks, and it's a 20. This is the 1960s, so this is big money back then, right? And he pushes that back in, and Ruth kind of gives him the eye, and the plates are going back further, and the ushers are coming back, and he's going back in there he, again, and he pushes it, comes back out, it's a 20. He pushes the bag in, because let's admit it, if you're visiting in a church, you don't want to give them everything, right? It's, 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 that's for your home church or whatever. And so he pushes it back in again. The plates are there on top of him. He has one desperate dive to go back into his pocket. He pulls it back out. It's that same stinking 20. The plate comes by. You're Billy Graham. Everybody's watching, so he puts it in the plate with a smile on his face. Plate goes by. The ushers take it to the next row, and Ruth whispers in his ear, Don't worry, Billy. God gave you credit for the five. <laughs> it's the attitude. It's the attitude with which we give. Realize the amount to give and the advantage of giving. What's the basic amount that Christians are to give according to Scripture? Tithe. There is no way you can redefine the term to mean anything other than a tenth part, a tenth place. Okay? And a tenth is what, it's Old Testament, it was before the Old Testament law, it was the Old Testament law, it's given at the, at the end of the Old Testament again, it's told about Christians contributing in the New Testament, so I would say that the very basic of what we're supposed to do as believers is tithe, tithe. According to Share Your Faith magazine, as I said, Christians now give less per capita than they did during the Great Depression. We have an incredible economy today. When we finally look at those in church, at best 25% of congregation members give. That's at best in most churches across the board, okay? Um, at best, three to 5% actually tithe in most churches. This is an interesting figure. If you make less than $20,000 a year, you're eight times more likely to tithe than somebody that makes over 100000 a year. I think it's hilarious. People are always looking, you know, they want to get real wealthy people to come to their church because they'll give money. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. But let me tell you this, too. 80% of all Christians who do tithe have absolutely no credit card debt. 20, in fact, 30% of all tithers in the U.S. are debt-free, so maybe there is something to allowing God to run your money instead of yourself. Bob Rafus, would you give me an amen on that? Is there an advantage to when we trust God? Absolutely. God accuses his people in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, of failing to tithe, and in an unprecedented, almost unprecedented fashion, I think there may be another example, God challenges people to test him in this. There are very, very few places in Scripture where God says, hey, test me, try me, 
Try me and see if I can't provide better and more for you with the 90 than you can with the 100 on your own. God says that it is stealing. God promises to abundantly supply for our needs when, our, when God's people give to him and contribute to him. I find it very interesting that God says that. I can tell you from 35 years of tithing experience that God is faithful. Right down to the dime on some things, I can tell you. I can tell you that it is a testimony to your unsaved children, to your unsaved neighbors, unsaved co-workers, when you do better on the 90 than they do on the 100. I can tell you it is. Because why? Because money is the language of this world, isn't it? And when they see that you live differently than they do, it makes a big dif difference to them as well. Jesus tells us where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me speak especially to those of you who are born in another country. You've come to this country. You've heard all your life that America is a country, you know, with what, gold-paved roads and all the rest of that stuff. And you've learned once you got here, it's really different from that, isn't it? It's hard, and it takes a lot to live here, doesn't it? And your, your relatives back home, most of them don't understand just how expensive it is to, be, to live here and try to succeed here. And everybody wants you to send money home, don't they? It's true. You have to learn, like all the rest have to learn, we all have to learn, make God the priority first. Amen. This is not the promised land. Amen? Amen? The promised land is what we're going to where there the streets are paved with gold. I, I've not seen Gold Streets and Burlington Avenue, or, or I haven't seen it. So instead, implement this approach, and I'll close in the next three, four minutes. Implement a new approach in your life. If you don't give to the Lord, if you don't give, if you don't tithe, challenge you. Test the Lord in this. Make it a priority. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, on the first day of the week, guess what? The New Testament believers were worshiping on Sunday from the get-go because it was the Lord's Day, not the Sabbath, but the Lord's Day. On the first day of the week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. This passage brings out four points that we should give personally, that we should give promptly, that we should give in a premeditated fashion, and we are able to give proportionately. Personally, there's the implied you. When you come together... And maybe you're paid once a month, maybe you're paid twice a month, whatever. Generally speaking, at some point, your worship experience should include giving money to the Lord's work on the Lord's day. Promptly, on the first day of the week. Don't wait around. Do it. Do it. Premeditatedly. We think it, when we hear that word premeditate, we think of it being negative, don't we? Premeditated murder, premeditated, you know, whatever. All it means is you're planning ahead to do something. Plan on Saturday that you're going to give on Sunday. Right? Write the check. You know? Bring the cash. Do whatever you're going to do. Plan ahead of time to do it. I would tell you this, and you will see a radical change in your lives if you do this. Make the Lord, paying the Lord the first bill of the month instead of the last. Amen? Amen. Make paying the Lord... The first bill of the month, not the last. Because I guarantee you what we will do, because it's our nature, is we'll wait until the end and then we'll say, well, you know, that extra trip to here, there, or the other place, that costs more than I thought so, so we'll shortchange the Lord because he's got the cattle on a thousand hills anyways. He doesn't need it. You know what? He doesn't need it, but you do. I do. We need it. So premeditate. Think about it ahead of time. And then proportionately, guess what? He says, in keeping with your or his or her income. God is the only one that's ever created a fair tax system. Democrats don't do it. Republicans don't do it. God does it. 10% of $13 an hour is the same as 10% of $26 an hour to that individual making that money. 
It's not the same amount. God never says give the same amount. God says proportionally to your what you make. Don't worry about what somebody else makes. It's between you and the Lord. W.A. Criswell, who was pastor of First Baptist Dallas for about 100 years, um, he, seriously, he was still preaching. He was 90-something. He was still preaching. And uh, there was an ambitious young man. This story took place back in the 40s, I think, after Criswell had been there about 10 years or so. And there was an ambitious young man who told his pastor he promised God to tithe his income. And he came to Pastor Criswell, Dr. Criswell, and he said, please pray for me to bless my career. And at the time, the young man was making $40 a week, and he began to tithe $4 a week. And he was so happy and so pleased. And God continued to bless his income over the next few years, uh, uh, over the next decade, actually, to the point that he was then an executive in the oil well industry, and he was tithing $500 a week. And again, you've got to go back to the time to see how much money that would be. It would be a lot today. He called up Dr. Criswell and asked for an appointment. He said, you know, Dr. Criswell, I know I came to you back then, but I would like to ask if I could be released from my promise of tithing on 10% of my income. Dr. Criswell said, I don't see how you can be released from your promise, but we can ask God to reduce your income back to $40 a week because you didn't have any problem tithing four back then. <laughs> don't do that, sir. Don't do that. Don't covet. Learn contentment. Realize there is a joy in contributing. I'm going to close with a story. And uh, over about the past 20 years, there's been a friend of this congregation, and I will not, I will never identify this man or woman, boy or girl, but over the last 20 years, this individual has given me tens of thousands of dollars over 20 years at Christmas time to give to people in need. There are people who are sitting in here today. You've experienced this. In fact, in fact, um, I think that there are over 100 families that have been directly affected over those years of time, probably well, well over 100 families. Everybody is always surprised and shocked when they see Pastor Richard or myself show up a night or two, a couple of nights before Christmas to spread the old joy and cheer. And everyone, when they see us at that time of year, are always at least grateful and happy to see us because they've heard of the tradition that happens oftentimes at Good News. And everybody is always glad. And everybody always says, thank you, thank you. You know, praise God for this and everything else. But I think throughout history, as I've been recording this, only 20% or so of the people ever give me a note to take back to that individual or those individuals to say thank you. And I think in 20 years, only two people have done the exact same thing. There's a joy that comes in contributing. I mean, it's the highlight of my Christmas. I get to take somebody else's money and give it to people. I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's, there's a joy with that. There's a joy in being able to give that you will never, ever experience if you grasp so tightly to what you think is yours. Be willing to give it over. Be willing to give up what the Lord lays on your heart, not what some guilt preacher preaches and tells you to do, but what the Lord places on your heart. And do it, and you will find joy in doing it. You will find joy in contributing. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today in this area of our lives in which we need to be obedient in. And so, Father, we pray that you would speak to us about our need and how it is that we should overcome coveting, how it is that we can learn to be content and the joy we can have when we seek opportunities to give to you, your, your work, and your people. For we pray now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen.